Thank you very much, Tony. <coughs> it is always a great pleasure for me to be back in Finland uh, <coughs> and to be in wider, both in Finland and wider. And I think that uh, I'm particularly pleased because I'm presenting the results of research which uh, has been supported by WIDA and which has been uh, carried out during the last two or three years. In my presentation, I will present um, uh, those data, those results, as well as some of the more recent uh, uh, numbers which have appeared during the last two or three years. Now, I think that the, the key point is that the, this presentation tells a good story, like the one that uh, Marcelo Neri uh, presented this morning. Normally, in, in the field of development, you always hear about child malnutrition, a negative growth rate, balance of payment, uh, disequilibrium, and all that. Now, this time, we have a few th good things to say, both in terms of what has happened and in terms of policies. Now, this comes out from this book. There are all these people that uh, have participated. I think there are some... Uh, Nora is here, uh, Dante Contreras is uh, somewhere in the room, and <clears throat> Tony participated actively to the project. And we have many institutions, the Central Bank of El Salvador, Sepal, Flaxo, uh, many universities, mainly from Europe, uh, Latin America, and the United States. Now, this is what we want to explain. This is a quite a striking chart, which I, I've been longing to see for many years. Latin America has had for a <coughs> long time a very high income inequality, and this is the, the inheritance of the La Colonia, the colonial system. So latifundia and then a, a, a system of education which was segregated and, and so on and so forth. Now, you see that the, the data start from the early 1980s. This is the net distribution of net household income per capita. And it starts from 1980, and in 1980 it was already 49, which is one of the highest. And then you see that uh, during what we call the, the lost decade and the period of the Washington Consensus, basically went up to 51. Uh, and then during the subsequent 12 years, what the period called the adjusted, uh, the augmented Washington Consensus, it went up again, and the peak was 2002. So it went up. The whole, this is the average for the whole region, excluding Central America, excluding the Caribbean countries. Uh, so these are 18 countries. So that, that uh, a big rise, basically, from a really high level, from almost 49, so more than five points in two decades. And then we see that uh, with what we call, what I call the new policy approach, inequality in about 10 years, in this case eight years, falls below the level of the early 80s. So one could say, well, this is a statistical illusion, but we heard this morning from uh, Marcelo Neri with very detailed data, this is not true. Uh, Nora has produced another volume uh, which came out three or four, three or four two or three years ago, which uh, confirms that. And so now there is pretty much of a consensus on this. Uh, now, there is a lot of variation. Eh? Not everybody has improved. In Nicaragua, had an increase in inequality. And Argentina, up to 2010, was the, the, the leader with minus nine Gini points from 2002 to 2010. And uh, now, there are some uh, differences. South America, and particularly the Cono Sur, so the southern part of Latin America, is being doing better than the, the Central Americans. And <clears throat> so there is some variation. But, I mean, altogether, all out of 18 countries, 15 show a very marked decline in inequality. Now, I want to say, well, okay, you know, 2002, 2008 were good years, it was growth, high international prices, and so <clears throat> the decline is due to a favorable world environment. Well, first of all, it's quite clear that this is not true because China, India, and many other countries uh, had growth, but uh, inequality rose during this uh, period of bonanza, global bonanza. But if I take data for 11 countries, because we don't, we don't have data for all the, these countries, we say, but anyhow, these are the main countries, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and so on and so forth. So basically, we see that uh, this decline continues up to 2012. And this morning, we heard that in Brazil, up to March of this year, inequality has continued falling, even in 2014. So the debate is, is this decline a sort of a cyclical uh, due to good condition, or is it structural? And our reply is, it is structural. 
Now, if you do a statistical test, I mean, if you look at the upper table, you see GDP growth during the 2002-2008 was 5% on average, 5.4% for the region, and the average yearly decline of Gini was 0.4 points. Now, during the bad years, relatively bad years, 2008-2015, uh, the growth rate went down to 3.1, but uh, the inequality fell even faster. And if you take 2009, which is the year in which Latin America experienced a contraction, basically inequality goes down. So if you test it statistically, you see that there is basically no relation, so that the inequality and growth are orthogonal. So it is not growth, it's something else. What is it? Now, this morning there have been, uh, Francois mentioned that, um, I mean, there is, there is all this debate about the top income and uh, uh, that the need of having, uh, of completing the distribution of income using tax data. For Latin America, we have only three countries which have uh, data for that. And so we have three corrected genies. So genies which do take into account the information provided by tax returns data. And these are Argentina com covering 2001-2004. So you see that the, the one corrected is the, the dotted one and is above. And the difference is about six points, which is not, is not small. But you see that the trend is about the same. In Colombia, the same, is higher, less. And in Uruguay, you see that uh, the, uh, the distance is less. And you see also that the distance starts growing a little bit. Eh? So the distance between <coughs> the uncorrected genes, which is the, 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 the straight line, and the dotted line is uh, two points in uh, 2009 and almost three in the last year. So, and of course we were very worried because we say, well, there might be a, a bias in the data. So we know very well that the household budget surveys do not capture the, the top 1% or the top 10%. And so now using, uh, using uh, this type of data, uh, tax returns for these three countries, we see that the trends are in parallel. So what am I going to say? I mean, the conclusion, so the whole argument, is likely to be valid, at least on the basis of these three countries. Now, somebody asked me, uh, <coughs> I think Andrew Berg asked, uh, if uh, <coughs> this is what happens everywhere. And you know, now there is this book by Piketty out, which says inequality is rising. So there is this uh, general pessimism that inequality is a sort of an unstoppable <coughs> Phenomena. This is not true for everywhere. This is true in Italy, it's true in uh, Europe, it's true in the US, it's true in China, and it's, true, it's, true, it's true in India. But it's not true in uh, Latin America. Now, here what we did, we divided the main regions and we took two periods, the 90s and 90s, which are the years of adjustment and Washington Consensus. And you see, for instance, Latin America during this period, 14 rises, one no change, and three, three drops. So the, the 20 years between 80s and 90s were years characterized in Latin America by an increase in income inequality. Now, you see that uh, during the subsequent 10 years, more or less, the date vary a little bit from region to region. Basically, we see that we have 15 falls, one no change, and two rises. Now, we also see that in, uh, in the Southeast Asia, out of seven countries, four, four show a falling inequality. And these are South Korea, mm, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and another one which I don't remember. Now, if you look at Africa, Africa, there are data for 21 countries. Now, Africa is about 50 countries. So we have data only for 21 countries, and we see that uh, uh, more or less um, we have... Uh, half, a little more than half, which apparently show some decline in inequality, although the data are not as good as in Latin America. And this is a point which certainly requires investigation. Now, there is a lot of relevance for, what, for poverty, what we did. Uh, Nora, in one of her many papers uh, produced with, uh, other, with colleagues, shows that about 40% of the poverty decline, which has occurred during the last 10 years or so, it's not being due to growth, but it's being due to an improvement in distribution. So here comes a debate with the UN. I mean, the MDGs, the uh, MDG number one is reduce poverty enough, but they, they don't say anything about inequality. And now I think there is the strongest case for the post-2015 goals. I'm part of the CDP, so the body which discusses all that. 
is to include inequality among one of the goals that the country should uh, try to reach. So if you, are, like, if you take the case, of course, the, the more, most important are the countries like, let's say, Bolivia, where poverty fell by 25, 25 points. You know? And almost 60% of that decline is due to a better distribution. So uh, to live in a more equal society is good per se, but it's also important to reach uh, a lower poverty. Now, <clears throat> the, the last decade is also important uh, uh, because uh, this uh, re reduction in inequality basically brings in more, more, more consensus. This is the Latino barometer. There is also the African barometer. barometer. And uh, as you see that... Um, and there is quite a change. The, 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 public, the public perception of the performance in terms of eco economy, country progress, and fairness of the economic distribution actually deteriorates between the mid-1990s mid and 2002 and improves later on. So in a way, there is a recognition by the people and then the political system. And that. Now, the question is, what explains that? And in doing that, I think that uh, there are, you know, in the debate, there are people saying, well, it's luck where there are glo good global conditions, or growth, or policies. Now, what I'm going to say is that basically it depends on public policy decisions. Some are good, some are less good, but uh, what to get. Now, to disentangle that, we basically, it's, it's quite a complicated problem, because if you use household budget service decomposition, then you miss many other information, like exchange rates, public expenditure. You miss all the <coughs> information on public spending, for instance. Now, if you use macro panels, uh, then you capture some, some information on the one side, but then you, you lose all the individual characteristics on the other. So we tried to do both. The, so we started with decomposition for six countries in the region, using the standard decomposition, which is the Milanovic, or the Lerman and Itzaki. And, I mean, I, for reason of time, I cannot uh, explain you what they are, but basically you take uh, the distribution at two points in time, at the beginning, at the end, uh, and then you see whether the changes are due to changes in the uh, concentration coefficients of uh, different sources of income or in their own share in total income. Now, here I reproduce two results for two countries, and I reproduce them for Chile and Ecuador. And, in, uh, and we also indicate which is the political regime, because I mean, you cannot talk about policies if you don't talk about politics. No? And actually, you see that in, in, uh, in the yellow part, both for Ecuador and Chile, these are years of rising inequality. Well, you see that the absolute changes in Gini was zero plus. The absolute changes in Gini labor was plus 2.4. The skill premium rose by 34%. The skill premium is the ratio of the wages of skilled workers uh, divided by the by the, by the wages of the unskilled workers. Then for some countries, we, we, we look at whether there is a change in the urban-rural wage gap. And then we have capital incomes, uh, public transfers, and remittances. Now, uh, so you see that during the last, the last uh, decade of the last century, basically, is all yellow. So, and then you see that uh, by, through this decomposition, you see that the overall genie, for instance, in Chile, falls by minus 4.3 points, and in the labor income explains the largest part because it falls by 3.3 points. And then we see that the skill premium, which explains to a large extent the, the change in GE labor, is uh, falling almost by the same amount that in the prior period. Now, the rural, rural urban income is not very important in Chile because uh, more, much of the population is urban. Now, and then we look at other, the other aspect. There is very little information on capital income. No, normally in service, they, they account for 2% of total income because the, the top income basically escape. Uh, they're not covered by the, the service. Now, the public transfers, they are quite, quite uh, um, equalizing. And then the remittances. Now, remittances in Chile are not relevant, but in Ecuador, they are quite relevant. Uh, Ecuador, at some point after the crisis of 2000, to 2003, I don't remember, there was a massive wave of migrants. They, they went to Spain, Europe, Italy, and so on and so forth. So if I look at the decomposition, I can conclude that Gini fell during the last 10 years. Labor income, you see, explains even more than the total Gini fall. The, uh, the rural urban gap is an important variable in doing that. Public transfers have been equalizing, and remittances have been equalizing. Now here there are another types of de another decomposition. <coughs> which is part of our volume. 
So now, th these are based on service. So you have labor income, pension transfers, and other non-labor incomes, which means uh, remittances and capital income. And you see that uh, the decline in inequality in labor income explains 60-70% for these six countries of the total decline in income. And then you see that pensions, uh, there is a huge variability, so it depends how the pension systems are designed. And you see that um, broadly they, they explain about 20%. And public cash transfers, or like Bosa Scola, again, that captures some 20%, and other non-labor incomes, uh, 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 a small amount with the exception of Paraguay. Now, <clears throat> these are the growth incidence curve of uh, la labor, and this is why the the main explanations uh, of why Gini falls, because as we saw for the case of Brazil, this is Argentina and Chile, the variation of really early, early wages uh, in between, say, during the first decade of this century, and you see that the wages of the bottom people, I mean, the poorer people rise much faster than the, the richer people. Now, what explains that? And I think here we uh, try to list all the factors. I think that there are many factors, and I think as far as I know, it's very, very difficult to provide a conclusive uh, answer. Uh, I mean, the decline in returns to education, i.e. the skill premium, basically could be to many factors. One is the rising in, in red, is the rising supply of skilled labor due, due, due to higher public spending on education. Now, uh, perhaps the demand for uh, skilled labor stagnates during the last decade. I mean, so the modernization of the economy, like computers and machine tools and so on and so forth, that might have occurred earlier on. Now, or there is the argument worsening uh, equality of higher education. Now, there is high demand for unskilled labor because the, in some countries, like Argentina at some point, basically one, the regimes adopted the competitive exchange rate, which shifted labor from the services sector to agriculture. Okay, so agriculture is much more unskilled labor intensive. So the macroeconomic policy can affect the demand for unskilled labor. Then one, another point, which was again mentioned this morning by uh, Marcelo Neri, which um, now with an increase in schooling, migration, and uh, that the amount of and demographic decline, basically <coughs> the supply of unskilled labor rises less, less uh, quickly. So the finding of the composition for the six, 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 six case studies, basically the decline in the skill premium, most likely due uh, to rising supply of skilled labor, although we know not the entire story. Then we find out, the fact that is not mentioned so far, a decline in the rural-urban wage gap. Now why this occurs, I mean, we have only two or three cases. Well, uh, Honduras, uh, there are two, two or three countries that show that. One is that if you have a competitive exchange rate, basically you shift the labor towards the tradable sector, and agriculture is one of the, the is in many countries, is still an important sector. Now, the second one is that world agricultural prices have risen, and so the returns to agriculture have risen, and therefore wages in agriculture has, uh, has increased. Then, of course, we have the social, uh, an increase in social assistance transfers, which was permitted because these were financed in, or, in a non-inflationary way, basically due to higher, uh, to higher taxation and better spending and better targeting. Then we have remittances. Now, remittances, you know, in the literature, they are uh, considered to be inequalizing. I mean, until recently, remittances, are, so there is the hump theory of migration. So the people who migrate are the middle class because migration is private, so you have to pay $10,000 to the coyotes who take it to the United States. And uh, now we do see for the case of El Salvador, which is a country where 35% of GDP is migrant remittances, GNP, sorry. So you see that remittances, uh, uh, the, the blue line is, uh, is including remittances, the, the pink line is excluding them. So you see that remittances in 2000 reduced income inequality by GINI by three points, and in the last year by six points. So one could argue that perhaps migration should be one of the future development policy. Now, okay, here we know something about the, what we call the immediate causes of inequality decline, but then the question is that, uh, what are the underlying factors in uh, this inequality decline? And to look at that, we discuss, first in theory, then we do a regression analysis, and we say, luck. Luck is a favorable external condition, more trade, trade liberalization, remittances, finance, and, and all that. Second, growth. Thirdly, 
exogenous changes in dependence and participation rate, which we don't discuss because they are not significant, basically. Then we look at the new policy model, which touches upon macro labor tax, health education, and social transfer. Now, uh, I think that uh, as far as the luck is concerned, I mean, in terms of trade rose, and therefore there was an income effect and the balance of payment effect. The migrant remittances rose for certain countries, and there was a financial bonanza for a number of years. Now, what are the distributive effects uh, of, uh, for instance, an improvement in terms of trade? Well, I think there will be a general effect due to the income effect, but the distributive effect is negative. Because if the copper price rise, I mean, the, the copper production is very capital intensive. It's not labor intensive. So all the mining countries of the Andes, basically, they should have seen their own income distribution, primary income distribution, worsen. Now, of course, if the government tax the rents, uh, and then, then, of course, they can be used uh, effectively. Now, in the financial sector, the, the increase in financial flows, has it benefited the small and medium enterprises? No, because there has not been financial innovation, or very little of that. So basically, more finance went to the, to the big guys, which received finance before. So what uh, <clears throat> the direct effect, we think, is uh, unequalizing. Now, the indirect effect is that, okay, you have an income effect, and you may, really, you may lessen the balance of payment constraint to growth, and therefore, so altogether, ex ante, we say, well, there shouldn't be a major force in equal, of equalization. Growth, we already saw that before. Growth, the, the, if you just do a simple bivariate relation, growth is uh, the coefficient of the growth effect is basically non-significant. And, in, and you, you don't need to rely too much on numbers. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, try to think, China is the fastest growing country. It's also the country with the fastest growing inequality. India is growing very much, and inequality is growing very much. So it's not the rate of growth which matters, but the pattern of growth which matters. Now, so do we have deliberate policy changes? Well, I think that it's important to look at the history of Latin America during the last 20 years. I lived in Chile with General Pinochet, under General Pinochet, and so I experienced personally the <coughs> life under this type of regimes. And now, fortunately, the region returns to democracy since the 80s and 90s. Then there is a, a democratic consolidation. There is a, a growing dissatisfaction with the Washington Consensus policies. You know, this Latino barometer is, very, is a very useful tool. And then there is gradually a shift towards center-left regimes, which, uh, and the, the, uh, Ken, Ken Roberts, who wrote the uh, political chapters in our volume, basically said, this is not that everybody's become a socialist, but basically it's, a, it's not an ideological realignment, but basically people voted with their own pockets. And, of course, if you have regimes which are more inclined to listen to, to the voices coming from the poor, perhaps uh, they, they will introduce policies which are consistent with that. And then there are policies below us, perhaps even Colombia, even Mexico, which are beginning at center-right governments. Now, <clears throat> uh, I think we'll, we'll skip this one. Now, look, this is the most striking thing. Since 1998, the red one are the center-left regime. The, cent the center rights are the blue line, and the black line are the center government. So you see that there is a total shift in political regimes. And without that, I am not sure that things would have changed much in Latin America. And I think this is a debate which is very important in Europe in this moment, because the certain different political forces, they favor different policies. For instance, in Germany, if you talk to Schulz, he says very different things than Merkel. Now, if we look at uh, how much uh, inequality has fallen by type of regimes and per year, first we do it per period, but the period could be three years or seven years, so we have to standardize by the number of years. turns out that the radical left, like Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, uh, basically have declined by half a point of, during their own regime, not, not when they are. Now, the, the more efficient one seems to be the social democrats, i.e. Brazil, uh, Uruguay, Argentina, Peru, perhaps. The centrists also have a certain amount. And then the interesting thing is that even the center-right regimes, on average, have a small decline in inequality, a small one. Now, what is this new model? The new model is, I think that this morning, I, even from Marcelo, didn't hear much about macroeconomics. And I think that when we talk about inequality, we should talk about distribution first, and then redistribution later. 
And I think that the main topics, uh, I mean, the main effect of the good macroeconomic policies is to change the market distribution of income. So what are the, the policies which have been introduced? What is this new macro model? Well, first of all, it's a hybrid model. So it's, uh, and I think that uh, Brasil Pereira in uh, Brazil has been arguing for this structuralist macroeconomics. <laughs> Uh, in which the macroeconomy is development-oriented. It's not only to, to balance the books. So we have prudent budgets. I mean, uh, if, we, if we European are looking at uh, budgetary numbers in Latin America, we, are, we have dreamy eyes. I mean, you know, in uh, 2006, 2007, the region basically had a total surplus, not a primary surplus, a total surplus. You know? Then we have a progressive tax, an active and progressive tax policy, which raised the taxation by three to nine points of GDP. Uh, we have an increase in public expenditure. We have counter-cyclical monitoring fiscal policies. And there is an attempt to have a competitive real exchange rate. Now, the real exchange rate basically shifts resources to the traded sector and away from the untraded sector. So if the <coughs> traded sector is unskilled labor intensive, then just by that, you are improving the distribution of income. Now, then the other thing which is uh, very important in, in this world affected by this crazy finance is basically that mu a much better prudential regulations of domestic banks. And uh, there is an author, Liliana Riojas Suarez, who works in CGD, who has written many papers on that. And many people have argued for the missing financial crisis in Latin America. Latin America had so many financial crises, but now no, no more. Now, the trade regime has been unchanged, and then there have been changes in, in international financing. You can see, uh, I just, uh, what, the, what did happen? I, well, perhaps I canceled them. Now, labor market policy is also important for affecting the primary distribution of income, not, not the redistribution. Well, there is a, first of all, there is, a, uh, again, what Marcelo mentioned this morning, there is a, an increase in the job formalization. You know, during the 80s and 90s, I mean, there has been a massive increase in in the number of people working in the informal sector. Now, this is not particularly good for, the, for income distribution. And here, during the last decade, you have the opposite movement. Then you have more work inspection against informal employment. You have recentralization of wage bargaining, which tends to flatten the distribution of wages. Then you have a rise in minimum wages, which, uh, uh, I mean, just look at Brazil. I mean, uh, real wages, uh, these are real. So you see that uh, uh, if 2,000 is equal to 100, I mean, Brazil now is doubled by 2010 and probably by now tripled the, the real minimum wage. And so all the yellow ones, they have very, very large increases. And the countries, they, they did not increase minimum wages, but uh, Nora told me that they're about to do that now, is Mexico. So minimum wages, and now minimum wages affect the primary distribution of income. So it's not a form of redistribution. It's a form, you operate on market incomes. Now, tax policy. Here, too, basically, I remember when I, I did the paper now 20 or 30 years ago, I remember that in Argentina, the income tax represents something like 1% or 1.5% of GDP. And uh, I mean, something unbelievable. Now, during the, <clears throat> if you take the, the, the neoliberal revolution, basically, the tax GDP ratio basically has fallen by 1.5 points. And if you look at the, the tax effort in, in during the 2000s, there's been a, a very large increase. Uh, on average, the region has increased tax GDP ratio by about three, four points. You should have a picture here. You see, so this is uh, uh, Latin America tax about 15, 16 percent before. Then, of course, there is uh, a fall in taxation because of the crisis of 91. So you go back to steady state in a way to 1998, but then since then, there is an increase in uh, about three points. And uh, uh, now, why is taxation particularly useful? Well, <clears throat> taxation, first of all, uh, permits you to f follow a budgetary policy with no inflation. Now, if you have inflation, then, then you'll have a crisis, uh, you'll have uh, in macro instability. Now, second, taxation allows you to have a countercyclic um, macroeconomic policy and allows you to raise the bolsa scholar, the oportunidades, which are very important. Now, I think that it's also important, um, first I'll show you this one, to look at tax incidence. So there has been uh, a very large, I mean, a, a substantial increase. It's still not sufficient, but an increase in income tax. 
particularly corporate income tax, but also a little bit in personal income tax. Uruguay, for instance, during the 80s and 90s, had completely abolished personal income tax. Now they reintroduced it. You know? So this is the Reynolds-Molensky index, which basically tells you what is the difference of the distribution of uh, incomes before taxation and after taxation. So when it's negative, it means that taxation is regressive, and when it's positive, that is progressive. So here is, these are detailed studies done in the region, and you see that in the 90s, the sign is almost everywhere minus, which means taxation was done through excises, value-added tax, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, during the 2000s, you see that with the exception of El Salvador and Honduras, uh, the taxation is either progressive or mildly progressive. And if you take the difference between the two, you see that the, 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 the changes in tax incidence basically has gone in the right direction. So taxation, is it a form of redistribution? Well, perhaps, but uh, is an important point. Now, people could say, well, okay, now the reason why government raised uh, tax-GDP ratio is because uh, commodity prices went up, and so that there was a bigger taxation. First of all, out of 18 countries, there are six which basically receive a substantial revenue from uh, the commodity sector. Now, if you take this one, this uh, sort of a correlation between international terms of trade. So if they go up, it means your government receives rents. Uh, and for all the 18, uh, 18 countries, <clears throat> and tax revenue. So these are terms of trade and tax revenue. I mean, if you do it for 1990-2007, the correlation coefficient is 0 0.18, so nothing. Now, if you do it only for the major commodity exporters, which are here we included, even those were semi-big semi ex exporters, no? medium exporters. So you see that it goes up a little bit, and only for non-tax revenue, which means royalties. Okay? So basically, there has been an effect of royalties, but there's been a, a much broader effort on taxation. Now, public social expenditure. This has gone up. Now, just look at the percentage of public expenditure. These are average from the region. Public expenditure on education uh, on GDP, 2.8, then 95, 3.3, 2004, 2010, 4.4. So there's been a steady increase even before the new regime came in in the public expenditure on education, which means that for every child, 0, 14, you see the public expenditure in constant, in constant prices is uh, 320, 511, 756, 1.4. So a multiplication by four times. Ten minutes, okay. Now, this is, uh, if you do a decomposition, because you can say, well, okay, now in Latin America there is a decline in uh, birth rates. So fewer children, smaller courts, they enter the, the schooling system. And then there has been growth. So, so, of course, if you have more growth, if, even if you apply the same expenditure, you get more money. So Gasparini and Cruz is basically they decompose it, and it appears that 50% is a growth effect, 16% is a court effect, but 33% is public policy effect. So at least in part, this is due to public policy. Now, this has allowed a large increase in secondary education, where, where there has been a lot of improvement. So the blue bars for every country for a, the various period analyzed. And then the, the red bar, basically, they indicate the, the Q5, Q1 gap. So to see whether the children of the top 20% divided by the, the, the ratio of the, the children of the top 20%. So basically, you see that almost everywhere this falls, which means that in the end, also the children of the, of the poor go to secondary education. And this is a factor explaining the, <coughs> explaining the decline in uh, the uh, wage gap. Why? Well, because the supply of people with at least secondary education skills has increased. Now, here there is the association between public expenditure and fall in the education, in the Gini education, which is the distribution of years of education in the labor force, and you see there is, again, a major decline. Now, social assistance, I can say very few things because it is quite accepted. <coughs> the conditional cash transfers or other transfers, basically they, they cost about 0.5 to 1% of GDP, and then we also have quite large pure transfers uh, and non-contributory pensions. So, now, the question is, we, I think that is still uh, to be debated, is uh, are the minimum wages and are, are the non-contributive pensions equally important or more important than the CCT? That it will vary. The answer will vary from country to country. Now, here is uh, how much CEPAL calculates the, 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 the Gini points decline due to the uh, welfare transfers. Now, and this is a nice chart by... Uh, 
La Senora Lustig. That basically, if you go from market income, you say it takes Brazil, so market income, this is for the latter part of the 2000, so the Gini was 0.79, then after taxation goes down by 1.4, then you have transfers, and then of course, if you impute what the government gives to people in, in terms of uh, subsidized education, subsidized health, and so on and so forth, basically you see the Gini goes down by 14 points. So, so the net effect of fiscal operation can be quite large. Now, what did this policy model not do? Because now we have say, been saying a lot of good things. So now we have to say something bad also to the Brazilian politicians. Now, first of all, land. I mean, now Lula promised to give land to the Semterra, four million families. It was not given. I went to Paraguay, uh, same. Guatemala, same. So, so no broader asset redistribution except education. Then industrial policy. No industrial policy. And I think that there are many people fearing reprimarization of export. Now, Brazil exports, uh, exported the airplane, the Embraer airplane. I flew from uh, Frankfurt to here. But I'm told that now soja is the main item in the balance of payment. So perhaps the region should reconsider that. Now, a broader power sharing, well, that is a... Now, and then reduce dependence on foreign finance. Now, now there is this, uh, this general idea that if you want to increase the re investment rate, actually, must be some uh, 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 mutual fund or some equity fund. And that. Now, so in, in the end, what uh, uh, people argue is that there has been a sort of a re social democratization of Latin America. Latin America follows Europe, at least the richer part of Latin America. And I think there is, uh, I, since I'm pretty much convinced with all the doubts that uh, Bourguignon expressed, I think that uh, the European way to, redistrib to distribution and distribution is okay. But there is no a radical parad sh para paradigm shift. And the question is, if you go to Guatemala, if you go to Bolivia, the issue of the land and other countries in the region remains crucial. Now, we did regression analysis, all that. I don't have time to explain it to you. But basically, the regression analysis confirms that. That uh, the first block are the... <coughs> Sorry. Okay. These are the global, the global factors, the first three. Basically, they're not particularly relevant. So the gains in terms of trade, they're not being equalizing. Magnet remittances, they're not equalizing, except where remittances <coughs> exceed 10% of GDP. The FDF, foreign direct investment in the region are extremely disequalizing because they are basically in the mining sector. So and if you think that Chile, Peru, this country, they, they, they throw out 10% of GDP in terms of the profit remittances. Now, GDP growth is uh, uh, modestly equalizing. The increase in human capital formation, which means uh, education, has a huge egalitarian impact. The real exchange rate, the changes in the real exchange rate from fixed peg in the past to a, a more competitive exchange rate, although with many problems, basically, as... Uh, produces effect when the governments are able to control it. Minimum wages cut sizably Gini. Tax rises were aff affected the distribution favorably. Public expenditure on social security and democracy. Now, I, those who are, now, a few challenges for what remains in the past. First of all, I think that structural reforms, this remains on the agenda. Now, we want, we want Latin America to continue declining because after a, uh, five or six point decline for the average decline for the region, they, they are still among the highest in, in the world. So one, there is a still an issue of asset, access to assets in several countries. Then dependence on foreign finance. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to bet my future of my own government on the decision taken in, in New York. Then I would avoid the reprimarization of uh, exports. That, uh, I mean, I think that countries should continue evolving towards uh, manufacturing, the normal evolution. And now, can we deepen these reforms? Yes. I mean, I think that uh, in the secondary education, um, th there has been a lot of success. But there is a, a problem of the quality of secondary education. The poor go to public schools, and the, the children of the family, they go to private schools. So they have uh, uh, easier access to university education. And I think that if we look at the situation of Chile, where Bachelet was elected on, on an agenda where saying, I will broaden the access to education, to tertiary education by the children of the poor. This is quite important. Now, if one wants to finance all this, basically one needs to uh, continue raising taxation. But not everywhere, not in Argentina, not in Brazil, because the tax burden is very high. It's higher than in Spain, in the UK, and in, similar to the US. 
So uh, if, you look, if you take a norm, so this log of GDP per capita, you see that the red dots are above the norm. They are Brazil, Argentina, and Nicaragua. All the others are below. So I think that uh, we calculated it with, uh, that basically there is, uh, the region should raise tax GDP ratio by about three points. Now, finally, this is, and this is the last chart, Tony, I think that it is important that uh, to raise taxation is very important for various reasons. Because if you use income tax or progressive uh, indirect taxes, you can improve the distribution. But for all regions, for the advanced countries, for the Eastern European countries, for the emerging economies, and for Latin America, 80%, about 80% of their redistribution comes through expenditure. So taxation explains about 20% of the improvement in the final distribution of income. Now, of course, if you want to spend more money, then you need to raise taxes. So thank you very much.